So I'm just getting myself set up today uh, for the continuation of a saga, which is our first uh, brioche rolls uh, rollout in this uh, facility. These are kind of the final format uh, from this first batch. Uh, and they this first batch ranges from this quality to uh, a small amount that came out this quality. Basically, I would say about 10% of them today will likely come out no better than this. This is a freeform test. We, we also did them on the sheet tray open. We like the way that they look in the tin and we love the fact that the customer can then put that tin into an oven for a couple minutes uh, before their holiday dinner and have warm rolls uh, for their dinner. The free form good batch is here. The free form worst of the worst is here. And this actually came from a single bowl. And so now I will recall what you missed, uh, which was really the, the entertaining part. So the brioche batch that we had yesterday filled the bowl to roughly here. Pretty big batch. Uh, it was enough to fill one of our oven racks with brioche rolls. That's basically what we aimed for, for this first initial rollout. We felt pretty comfortable with the recipe, uh, converted a, a, a yeasted recipe that I really like uh, into a sourdough recipe. Uh, the consistency felt great throughout the mixing process. Uh, the sourdough starter was at the right level when we introduced it. Everything was really great. Uh, Logan and I were talking and we decided to try a different workflow. Uh, typically we have dough in these bowls and the mix is done and shortly after the mix is done we cut the dough out as you've seen many times into bins. Uh, we already had 40 or so bins of dough from all of the bread that we had mixed yesterday and brioche was the last mix of the day. And we figured that, you know, this massive dough in this giant bowl would stay nice and warm and could do its bulk fermentation right here. And we could essentially just scale it out of this bowl at the end of our uh, bread shaping back into the bins that we had just uh, emptied out. Uh, and then basically the team could knead uh, the brioche on the table. Uh, and so we had planned for the brioche to feel like it did at the time that we had finished mixing it, then more fully uh, proofed and aerated, and so it should be okay to work with. Well, anyway, we got to shaping bread, and uh, we were checking on the brioche, and at first it wasn't really moving at all. Uh, in fact, I had stepped out to do some office work, and the team continued to shape bread. Uh, and I was being kept notified when they were getting close to the finish line so we could work on this together. Well, in about an hour's time, uh, all of a sudden we saw a big jump in the bowl. Uh, and another 30 minutes had passed and literally the brioche was at the very tippy top of the bowl. What we didn't notice, what was actually happening on the inside of the mass. So, the dough had ended in the 80 some degree range, uh, which is typically where we'll drive our doughs to Fahrenheit. Uh, by the time we were shaping it, it had in the middle of the mass risen to 110 degrees. Uh, and then towards the outer layers, it, it was hot, like, like low 90s. It had increased in temperature overall since we had left the mix. So clearly what I hadn't really thought about was the last time we had bulked something in mass in a big format like that, uh, I didn't have quite the same bowl size. And there is a change. Like if any of you have seen composting, I'm taking a cue from there. When you have like a cubic yard of compost, it heats up and holds its heat a whole lot better than if you have, say, a five-gallon bucket. 
My guess is that we experienced something very similar yesterday. So what is the result of a mix that has a huge amount of butter content when the mix reaches 110 degrees? Uh, by the time we basically took the brioche out of the bowl, a lot of the butter that we had carefully emulsified into the dough had rendered out and melted out of the, of the dough mass. I think most people would have at this point just said, it's over, like this batch is just done. But we had just dumped two and a half boxes of butter into this bowl. Boxes. It's like 80 some pounds of butter at my price point, it's a couple hundred dollars, a few hundred dollars of butter in this bowl, just butter. Then instead of water, brioche gets egg and milk. So, you know, even the water is expensive. Of course, we use heritage grain flour. This is a holiday bread. And if you look at some of the old recipe books, they don't really pull any punches and say like, this is a bread for affluent people historically. It's expensive to make and it's expensive. Um, so we were gonna do everything to see, I started thinking about it, like is there anything wrong with this dough? The butter is no longer at the proper temperature to reincorporate into the dough. The dough is fermenting nicely, no problems there. So the, the issue is really just cooling it down. We basically did end up scaling it out into a ton of bins, which I'm now going to work through. But between then and now was a whole new layer of processes. Basically, we took somebody who is interviewing for a position here. Actually, she was extended an offer of employment after successfully uh, mid-shift transferring her workstation into our walk-in cooler where she proceeded to degas and reincorporate the butter into these doughs once each dough had basically gone down to 60, 60 some odd degrees. That like Goldilocks temperature zone for butter where it is the right semi-solid where it just incorporates into dough. So in order to get all of these dough masses in bins from basically 100 degrees down to 60 rapidly, we had to take stacks of these bins and unstack them. We had to place them on top of all the objects in the cooler because the cooler was completely full, opened, and then basically a employee was in there or a stage was in there folding the doughs to expose the warm side to the cool and rapidly chill them times like 60 bins or something. So was, she had to actually exit the walk-in every so often to warm back up because she was in there for a couple hours basically mitigating this dough emergency uh, worth a few hundred dollars of dough. So anyway, uh, I'm going to now go into the walk-in and show you what happened after I update the team on what the heck's going on around here. I mean... Yeah, this was this was an adventure. I just like I think I just gave a 20-minute monologue on what happened yesterday to try to try to reenact it. So I'm going to be dealing with some difficulty here. Let me tell you about this dough. 50% of the baker's percentage is butter. That means that for every pound of flour there is half a pound of butter in this dough. It's a rich dough. A lot of the water is substituted with uh, milk uh, and eggs. So uh, straight brioche can go really as high as full egg substitution for hydration. We like the effects of milk on, on dough and rolls, so we like to play with that. Uh, Ours isn't straight milk because we have to take away from, from that and make room for our liquid starter. So there is water also as a result of the liquid starter. There's no actual like 
water in the dough. I don't actually run any water in this dough, uh, but there is water by virtue of the water that exists within the sourdough starter. So right now I'm degassing this brioche um, and I'm going to have to look at all these bins uh, individually and, and degas them. What's particularly challenging about about this work is even if this dough was exactly where I want it right now, meaning a, a little bit stronger, uh, less worked, um, I don't have a strong flour composition. So this uh, flour composition is meant to yield a cakey, soft uh, crumb. It's uh, in part bread flour, which is the primary flour that we have in the bakery is just vari variations of bread flour. We are, after all, a bread bakery. Uh, but we have added pastry flour into this mix. Uh, pastry flour is not, when, when we talk about pastry flour, we're not talking about the flour that we use in croissant type pastries. Croissant type pastries are a form of a bread pastry and they require good gluten development in order to properly uh, work. And so, you know, croissants usually also use bread flour. Uh, so basically, once you introduce pastry flour, you have a lower overall protein content uh, in your dough, and so your, your gluten development will be weaker, and it will not last as long. It's kind of a curve. So, you know, the life cycle is just weaker. Uh, so the, the problem of this particular batch is we had to add all that extra handling in the, uh, the walk-in. Uh, but now on the table, I'm getting really close to what I want. I have a really nice, smooth, degassed uh, version of brioche. And I'm going to have to take my time with it when this is done without flaw, uh, I can basically plop these doughs on here, quickly spread them out, and you know, by the time that we've already been, been together on this, I could pretty much be done and trade. It, it goes really fast from here when the dough is ideal. When butter is around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, it's very pliable and workable in the dough. So I thought, well, how do we get all these doughs down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit? We spread them out into as many bins as we possibly can. And then from there, uh, we expose them to cold air uh, and don't allow any hot air to be trapped on the inside. So we got to basically handle the dough and remove, like dispel all the warm air. So we thought about all that and, and it was really theoretical. We didn't actually know that it was going to work, but in our minds, we like built a concept that might work and it turned out that it did, you know, the test yielded a good result. So, um, now I'm hoping to have a pretty normal dividing experience with these. This is actually the first time I'm using our roll divider in this facility. I'm just checking its settings and making sure that it's going to be adequate for me on what I'm trying to do. I'm, I do have to make an adjustment if I hope to roll these actually up. This result for this particular batch of brioche buns is nothing short of remarkable because uh, these were declared indivisible on the dough divider um, yesterday. And if I flip this over right now, you know, I, it's a little sticky and I need to correct manually right now, which in a perfect world, I can just put these on sheet trays and line them up or put them wherever they're going to live. And now they can proof and be baked once they're done proofing. In my world today, I've got, I've got to kind of work them a little bit more, spend a little bit more time, and then I can really achieve 
Uh, the same result as though everything would have gone according to plan. Uh, and, and that's the success in all this is sometimes like just, just recovering is, is successful. I'm going to dust the tops, take two at a time and take them away from the flower, uh, flowered surface so I can get just a little bit of friction from the table and then set them aside. Now they're, now they're nice and smooth. And I'm going to bring my bench knife close so that I, again, this is not bread flour. So, you know, you have generally delicate dough and it's not meant to handle easily. Basically, the nicer your brioche, the worse it is for the baker. Uh, so, you know, you almost want to ask your baker how how their experience with the brioche is. If you know they if you ask the assistant baker in the house and they tell you, oh, it's one of the easiest doughs around. I can just fly through it. It holds together everything. It's likely it's likely a, a, a brioche that doesn't quite have the enrichment content because you can really a lot of people that say they make brioche and when you break down the recipe you know it doesn't really have the things that make brioche brioche which is really eggs and butter they're like little cakes you know like like mini cakes that that have part bread part cake in them uh, and and that's kind of the experience of eating them too we typically for a dinner roll would probably make them a little less enriched but when it's the holidays you know that's when the special breads come out and this is truly just like the beginning layer of uh, what people do with uh, enriched doughs especially during like special times of year uh, it, when you get into the holiday breads like panettone or uh, I can never say this word stolen uh, it, they they really add expensive ingredients into the dough it and it's meant to be like a special occasion when you eat that bread uh, so anyway, that's, we, we love making these brioche rolls this time of year, uh, because it's something special for our customers, uh, and, and also even for our own tables, you know, I, uh, but, uh, this was our first experience here in this bakery and it, what was particularly nice about it was. Uh, yielded a lot of really interesting lessons for the crew because how to respond in those type of moments um, when when some senior crew members are around is easy but what happens if like something like this happens when there aren't any really senior crew members around that have been in the garage and have seen all kinds of things you know in, in a garage bakery setting uh, we don't necessarily encounter these like massive waves of of problem. Uh, oftentimes, we actually intentionally highlight them because they're the learning moments. Uh, but over time, those learning moments sort of fade into the background, where when you're new, there's mistakes happening all over the place all the time. Half of which you don't even know are mistakes yet. You have to like uncover them, and, and then over time, the mistakes around you sort of become new ones that you don't know about, but the old ones don't always come re-emerging. For us, building strong doughs, bulk fermenting, scaling on the table, they're, they're the rhythms of our day-to-day. -day. So when, when it doesn't quite go as planned and you have to change all the plans that you had for the day in a moment, those are sort of rare. So yesterday, yesterday served as one of those. Uh, and, and that's why like, I appreciated it. Whereas in the past, that would have been sort of trauma, I guess. It doesn't have to be, I don't think. The roll divider is a really awesome thing. I think it's pretty much necessity when you start to make rolls for uh, a whole community. 
in our bakery, we have hand rolled a lot of rolls. And, you know, it's not really a, a thing that we make regularly, mainly because hand rolling rolls was very labor intensive. You know, it just takes time. Uh, and the nice thing about the divider is uh, you can, you can, by saving time on rolling right now, I can invest that time into ingredients. So uh, most bakeries don't do either, you know, like that cheap ingredients, cheap labor, like that's, that's just the way our economy tends to run. It's like, what are the lowest inputs that I can put into my product for the highest gain? And I guess like for me, it's, it's sort of hard to look at it that way because I more look at it can I still make a profit? Uh, can I make a healthy profit? But can I put ingredients in that I want to eat, that I want to bring to my parents to eat, that I want to say, hey, hey, mom and dad, like, be proud of what I'm making here. Like, this can feed you. Um, it, I think a lot of people don't necessarily for themselves even care about what, what they're eating. Um, and where it comes from and the quality. I think some people just don't necessarily share in that value, but for me, it's important. So uh, I think when, when we make these products, we should be making them with good ingredients. Uh, and if we, can save, if we can save on the process, make it a little bit more efficient along the way so that we can then in turn in, invest even more into the product, that's what it's about. You can then please the customer, still have a bottom line that's healthy, um, and be proud of what you do. It, it's like the the ultimate win. Sour brioche is not particularly a common product, uh, although historically it would would have been. Uh, we've been putting butter and eggs and in bread for a little while. Rolls have been a thing for for a while. Uh, if you would have been eating rolls as like a, you know, affluent person in Europe a few hundred years ago, uh, you would have probably been eating something akin to a sourdough brioche. Uh, probably a little bit rough around the edges, I imagine, because all hand handmade without like the benefit of really there's so like a lot of intuition, a lot less like understanding of all the various variables, so probably a lot of variation from day to day. Sourdough brioche is difficult in that way, uh, like any other sourdough product where the fermentation is more of a precision act that requires understanding. It's not as easy to chance a good sourdough product. Uh, and I think that's why you don't see them very often, because if you don't really have an understanding of, of how to develop a sourdough, uh, especially an enriched dough, if you don't have a good baseline sourdough starter that's fed well, uh, that, that's robust, uh, if you don't really understand the multi-stage fermentation process, bakeries just simply would add yeast, which covers all of that with one fell swoop and then some because it's just a very powerful uh, leavening agent. But like all other sourdough products, uh, there's there's just inherent benefits to flavor. There's changes in texture. There's there's just things that we can play with with time that uh, make sourdough compelling uh, in both sweet and savory applications. So, uh, and, and I shouldn't say that there is no precedent for enriched sourdoughs because Panettone is at, at its baseline supposed to be a sourdough product. Most Panettone that you can buy is not, but at its baseline it's this like really beautifully orchestrated uh, build of a sourdough starter that ends up uh, gaining enrichment itself through various stages of uh, progression until it finally comes together in, in the, the last stages of the dough. Uh, it's something that I wish to learn more about in future years, but w like we would love to introduce Panettone to this area, but in order to do so, I actually have to go have some great Panettone from 
someone doing this traditionally. Uh, it certainly doesn't exist in my area. I'm just basically flattening out all the sheets first. This is uh, probably, you could say, the anal approach to using a roll divider. Uh, I'm sure there's people who will watch this that use these at their jobs and probably, you know, fly through the batches a lot quicker, like could finish everything that I have to do for the next two hours already. And it's possible, like really I have, when, when you have a, a dough that you're super confident in, uh, that can sort of still take a little bit of a, of a beating that actually has some strength to begin with, like a higher protein content, the divider's a, a dream. Uh, I'm just being a little bit more careful again because of the fact that I haven't used this divider for a little while in rolls. First time making rolls in a few seasons, actually. We haven't had the bandwidth for it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm also easing my way back in because uh, we're going to make a lot more rolls this month. I want to make sure I really, you know, create decent product. After the saga of this dough, I'm just kind of babying it the rest of the way through. But I am getting further and further along to like actually building rolls in the divider, if you can tell. like Each division's getting a little bit stronger just because I'm learning about how this brioche feels in the divider and how many seconds I should be engaging the rolling mechanism. Uh, it's also, a, even with a, with a machine, like there, there's some feel and finesse to it. So hopefully by like division 100 today, uh, I'll uh, have this down. So that way next week it will be going really smoothly. I was digging around in a Baker's classic. The, the book is called uh, The Bread Baker's Apprentice by Peter Reinhardt, a uh, pretty well-renowned bread baker, uh, and flipped to the brioche section only to find three recipes. One was poor man's brioche, another one was middle class brioche, and another one was rich man's brioche. Uh, and like a backstory in history, that was interesting. Uh, and all of them were yeasted formulas. So I was reading through them and messaging with uh, Logan, and we basically just made some small modifications to start with uh, to account for the hydration of the sourdough starter. Essentially replaced, you know, the, the sponge in the formula for our sourdough starter. Uh, and we did not do a final Levon build. That's something that we have not really done a whole lot of for various reasons. So a lot of sourdough bakers will first build special Levons for their enriched doughs, you know, uh, sweet starters or, you know, uh, various uh, twists on a sourdough starter in order to introduce elements of their final dough uh, into the base ferment. Uh, we are, again, interested in exploring that direction now that we're in just a little bit more of a robust setting, but most of our builds have just been standard mother starter. There is milk in this recipe. It's not, you know, introduced in the base ferment. So uh, it wasn't too big of a modification. Um, we are in the like 30% inoculation rate for, for this. And based on yesterday's results, plenty of gassing power, I suppose. Uh, so the modifications seem to be appropriate with the exception of our weird uh, mixing bowl mishap which I'm pretty sure we'll be able to avoid moving forward. Nice thing is these are actually turning out quite uh, beautifully already. The ones that I have finished, I really have no fears over anymore. Uh, and yesterday was a day full of sort of uncertainty of whether we would be able to recover this whole batch of dough. So in that it feels quite nice. 
I flower the tops of the all the these divided rolls again varying my strategy from dough to dough the introduction of the extra flour here uh, helps smooth this uh, rather weak dough over and you could definitely overdo it I'm I'm not using any more flour than I need uh, and the the final roll is really just uh, trying to smooth it over and perfect it so that as they proof they have a nice smooth uh, outer shell where I rolled heavily I leave behind dough material and that's just a symptom of this being a partially a pastry flour in this uh, formula so even a different rolling strategy sometimes you can engage a lot more pressure in your in your roll in an ideal world I just get to transfer it like those like, these ones in the center are perfect just right out of the divider. I don't have to do anything about them. When things go well through the divider, that's what you can sort of hope for. If you have one smooth side, then you can essentially just place them downward onto the less smooth side, which will just basically smooth over on the bottom surface. We didn't introduce any form of grease into these uh, into these tins in our test, uh, and we were able to remove the rolls without really any worry. And it's likely because these rolls already have plenty uh, plenty of grease to offer these tins as they bake. This is not a diet product. These brioche rolls. Nor is it meant to be. I mean, this is really, we bring these out around, around times where people have feasts. Like all the other products that we uh, make around here, the whole cycle is long. Uh, these won't be baked anytime soon. Uh, so we won't be able to see them bake this time, this time around at least. Once I'm done rolling out another few dozen of these uh, buckets, uh, bins, I'm going to transfer them all over to the proofer and they will basically live there for around six hours uh, before they go in the oven. That's a 80 degree room with 80% humidity uh, and that's that's how we can get a sourdough product like this to uh, really give enough rise to be comparable to its uh, yeasted cousin. Uh, takes time uh, you don't just get the gassing power though in that time, you get a fermented food. Uh, so there's more than just the rise that's happening. Uh, and I think that's what sets these apart. Uh, they're still a decadent treat, uh, but they're a decadent treat that uh, it's really made in an old school traditional way. So uh, as far as like bringing out the holiday traditions as, as many of you probably do, uh, this is similar, you know, I, I think everything we do, I think it's one of the reasons why holidays around proof for the times where we see people who don't always come out the rest of the year. It's like the, the Easter and Christmas uh, churchgoers uh, for bread uh, that show up around, uh, around all the feasts. Uh, and, and of course, some of those same people come out to market every single week and buy their loaf. But some people, you know, just buy this type of bread for a special occasion. Uh, maybe it's out of their normal price range or too far away. It's a very big city that we, uh, that we live in here. And we are just one uh, small bakery uh, amongst a lot of people. So uh, it's, it's a time of year where people that don't always have our bread end up wanting it. The divider has some general rules in, in, in how you're supposed to use it properly. Uh, the bottom surface is not supposed to be floured, but the top should should be somewhat smooth to the touch. If it's super sticky up top, then it's not going to divide properly. So in most manuals for dividers, uh, they suggest that you can sprinkle the dough mass with flour if needed on top. This very much depends on the dough that you're trying to put through a roll divider. Uh, you might 
have a dough that is not enriched with so much butter that you are going to drop everything and save it if it something happens. Uh, it, you know, there's plenty of rolls, roll recipes that are uh, just really strong. The stronger the gluten development, the higher the protein content, the more you can just, you know, drop the divider on the dough, roll it up, and then just plop beautiful rolls onto parchment. The less gluten development, the more enriched the dough, the harder it is on the baker. And that actually holds true with a dough divider or not. Uh, the harder the experience on the table, the more enriched the flour is with, uh, with rolls. But those are pretty close to ideal. I, I'm gonna correct this one, this one, and this one, and this one, and the rest of them I should be able to just place. Uh, so I, like I said, as I go, I'm getting a little bit better at the rhythm for this particular batch of rolls. Doesn't mean they're not gonna stick at the bottom because this is ultimately like a very sticky dough. So that's why to get that final result, I need to be gent gentle right here and put them back on that, that upper side. So I'm, I also do that press action before I roll to gauge what the friction is between the plates and the dough. So I'll pick it up once to see does it lift right up or does it stick to the bottom and that's a good indicator for me of do I need to add some, some flour. So now I'm holding it in a tense position and then going to the right, which engages the cutters. And now it's cut the dough into 36 pieces. Earlier today, I was refining this uh, fine adjustment, which changes the depth at which it basically creates a little chamber. Uh, this can go up and down depending on this adjustment. So now I'm going to keep holding this down and engage this lever which rotates the bottom plate. One, two, three, four, five. That's a five second roll. I wanna unpeel pretty quickly. It helps kinda uh, make sure there's no sticking. And then I pull it out and can kinda judge the result. These were not quite as strong as the last division, but still better than some of the original ones that, that I did today. Uh, so another strategy that you can employ is to dust a little flour on this bottom surface now, knowing that you're going to be flipping it over. So if you're worried about it sticking to whatever you're flipping it onto, that's a way to control that. Once I flip it over, I'm going to kind of jiggle to get the dough off and this is dependent on the dough that you're working with. Some doughs will just plop right off. This is quite a sticky, enriched, decadent brioche. These middle ones are great. I want to pick them up sooner than later. I don't really want to give them any chance to settle in and start sticking to their surface, so I'll take the nice ones and immediately separate them. So these are now the borderline ones that I'd probably still put this one down and by the end of it you wouldn't really be able to tell. That's kind of the criteria is like is it going to make a difference in the final product to whether I correct it. Uh, I want to have some flour on my hands for rolling in general. That's my preferred method. Um, and then I like to practice with both hands always. Even though one hand is stronger than the other, uh, you can get a lot more done when you can work with two hands. And so I am rolling uh, and basically the, the dough is kind of rolling around this part of my, my hand. Uh, so, so then I'm using the top. Basically I'm doing the exact same thing that that's doing if you think about it. Uh, I am going in a circle while compressing it from all sides and, and thus allowing it to kind of form a tight skin on itself and kind of tucking it into itself as I go. Again, this dough really doesn't have the, 
the gluten strength to manipulate, so I can't go all in. Uh, if, if I had a true bread dough on the table, I could apply a ton more pressure without the consequence of leaving dough behind. Uh, not, the, not the end of the world here, but I don't think that the name of the game for these is pressure. Rather, it's kind of smoothing them over, acknowledging that the rolls that we're making are a little bit more of a mixture between something that's cakey and bready. Over time, if you're working in bulk, you gotta watch the surface that you're working on. If you have a bench knife nearby, it helps to just give it a quick reset so that you're working with a similar amount of friction and a similar surface. If you start getting a lot of dough on this surface, it's gonna be different to, to roll all the subsequent ones.